Hi, before we start the film, I want to let you know I will be at Twin Cities Con this year, November 11th, 12th, and 13th. I'll be selling my comics and artworks, and I have a table. So come see me at Twin Cities Con. Um, we'll put the link down below so you can get your tickets early. There is a discount for that as well. Mm -hmm. It's at the Minneapolis Convention Center. We love to talk to fans. Um, we love to see the support of the show. So come see me at Twin Cities Con, November 11th, 12th, and 13th. Oh. Now for the episode. Uh, you know, Nick, when you told me we were going to talk about the Incubus, I was like, oh, yeah, cool. this movie. I haven't yeah. seen this movie before in about 10 minutes, and I was like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> you should be ashamed of yourself. I think everybody says that in the first 10 minutes. Right? Uh, yeah. Welcome to the show, everyone. Today we're talking Incubus or The Incubus. I don't really know. Welcome back to the show, everyone. I'm one of your hosts, Kyle Gothi from GoatFilmReviews.com. Uh, we're going to find out why this movie was on the shelf in the video store and never got picked up. <laughs> I'm Nick from the St. Paul Filmcast. Thanks for finding us. Thanks for watching. And for our loyal fans, thank you for continuing to support the show. You can follow the show on Twitter and on Instagram. We do have a Patreon. Check that out to for some great do uh, deals to tell us what movies we should critique in future episodes. Both Kyle and I are members of Minnesota Film Critics Alliance. Check out the webpage for critic reviews as well as ours. And today we're going to talk about another Canadian slasher movie of the early 80s. It's Incubus, or yeah. The Incubus, or whatever. <laughs> Something. Something. Uh, Sam Cordell is a small-town doctor who, <laughs> along with authorities, has become perplexed by a series of murders and rapes that have taken yeah. place in Perplex rapid succession. He teams up with a hardened sheriff and a nosy reporter to find the culprit, unaware that a young man in town is also having premonitions of the attacks. All right, so this is directed by John Hugh, and we talked previous episode about Peep and Tom, how you change in your career from when Mike Polly did a lot of upstanding movies and then he went to do a horror movie and it crashed his career. John Hugh also did a lot of Disney movies. He did mm. TV shows and also did this horror movie. So it didn't really wreck his career, but also it did a, a variety spectrum of different movies. Yeah, and I think he's become most well known for the legend of Hell House. Yeah, that's another horror uh, movie. But he also did like the, the TV 70s. show The Avengers, and also did like the kids movie Treasure Island for Disney. Yeah, and I think well, one of the Witch Mountains. I think it was a Race or Escape. It was one of the Witch, Witch Mountain Witch movies of the Witch. Yeah, yeah. Of course, I've always known John Huff from his awesome. fantastic okay, film Howling. Howling Four: The Original Nightmare. Uh, I grew up watching all the Howling movies that, throughout right. there. Yeah, and, and yeah. Howling Four is is not a great movie, God, but he made it. And right. I still know, maybe I like it more than this one, <laughs> so let's break this one down. Um, so it has two writers, um, which if you want to look at my IMDb, they have nothing else to their credits. Mm -hmm. But uh, Ray Russell, who's also the author of this, yeah, he also did the screenplay now. for Mrs. Sardon Mr. Sardonkis, which you can find oh. on Sven Gulli, Yeah, Sardonicus. Which is that guy with the weird face, yeah, yeah. But also <laughs> uh, George Franklin, I couldn't find very much about this George Franklin, it's not really a lot of history for a lot of films. Mm -hmm. So screenwriting is a tough with this but also you have starring the great accomplice of independent filmmaking of the 60s John Cassavetes from The Fury he's in this movie so John Cassavetes from The Fury yeah. he's done so many I don't know, things he's, too. he's also been a director too that Scorsese says is the most unappreciated director as mm. well yeah yeah, and uh, Cassavetti's also, you could almost call him a writer. I think he's credited on Letterboxd as a co-writer because he rewrote 80% of his dialogue for the film. He hated the dialogue he was given in the oh, script. Oh, there's a, there, well, get to, when I get to the <laughs> so, review, you're right. Yeah, this is one of the things, there's a lot of things I retained that I appreciate this movie. There's a drinking game in this movie where you could drink every time John Cassavetes says sperm, which is not something I ever thought I would have to yeah. say out loud. As much as they say cocaine and body of evidence, they say that. Yeah. But yeah. He certainly <laughs> likes talking about sperm. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, rounding up, you have Erin Noble. She's uh, Cassavetes' kid in this mm -hmm. movie. She goes by a different name in this movie. She didn't do a whole lot after this movie. She's just one of those things that you see her face like, oh, yeah, she's from the Incubus movie. Yeah. I, I I haven't seen Class of 1984, but I remember seeing her in image from that film. Yeah. She has a very striking presence just because she does look she does look like like someone who like really was would have made those films back in the 80s of like kind of got that horror movie esque vibe to her. Like yes. she just yeah she seemed like she really would have popped in the 80s and didn't do a whole lot more than that. So I don't know it wouldn't happen. Um, happens so to yeah, you have cinematographer um, Albert Dunk who went on to do guess what Black Christmas. Oh, they're going to talk about Megiddo 2. 
Oh, the what Omega is that? Code. I've never heard of that. What is that? <laughs> he did the second Omega Code film. Oh, uh, as okay. well as All right, now uh, was it the fifth Doctor Doolittle film, Million Dollar Mutts? <laughs> That's a Dr. Doolittle thing. Yeah, that's a All real right. one. <laughs> no, I just think it's going to chuckle that he did Black Christmas. Eventually, yeah. maybe this year for Christmas, we'll talk about Black Christmas. I think I think at season the original four, one. season four, we're past now, like, the skirting around the movies. We're just going to have to hit some of these movies. So. Right, yeah. Because there's so many things about this. It's just like Black Christmas for this movie. There's so many things that you just... You yeah. can't forget. Right. Uh, someone else I want to point out in the film who I only remember for the stupidest reason is Helen Hughes. She plays Agatha Galen, the the adoptive mother of our potential killer. Yeah, I have dreams um, of killing. Yeah, yeah so H- Helen Hughes, I, she's known for a bunch of other things. She was in things like Visiting Hours, Billy Madison. I'll always remember her as the actress who was in Tommy Boy in the boardroom scene who can't stop talking about the whores taking her husband away. Oh um, my God! That's, they spent it on yeah, the whores. I'm gonna have to go back and see that. I, I yeah. could not like I could not break it out of my mind. I had to go yeah. watch the scene and halfway through this movie just so I could realize that that was her. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it's a, another one of those Canadian slasher films of just small budget to try mm-hmm. to get a large retained back. I don't think it did. I don't think it made a lot of money back from it. No, it's 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 such a peculiar idea, and and we'll talk about whether or not that peculiar idea works later. But yeah. it's such an odd. idea idea for a movie that seems so specifically bent on certain aspects that I wouldn't have expected to be something we'd talk about in 1982. Right. And it just, so I mean, you can say that it swings for the fences. It tries to do something completely different. I can't see this movie ever landing with a general audience. Right. And also, look at the cover. I don't know if, we could put the, if you could put up the cover. Mm-hmm. It's very similar to The Thing. Yeah, it's where, got the boom. Yeah, no. so I think the understand the thing was a big hit, and like that cover is the old cover. I think they tried to lift, you know, try to get oh that thing is did that. Let's use that as well to drum up even some more See, notoriety. That's the confusing part, though, is because the thing wasn't really a hit either, though. Like I know, it, and I think the idea was that they knew John Carpenter was making the thing, and he'd done. The Fog, and he'd done Halloween, and he, you know, he'd done some right. movies that were very popular. So I think the idea was to copy the thing, thinking it would be the a co- hit. poster, right? Yeah, and then when the thing wasn't a hit, it was like, well, this is the poster we've got, <laughs> right? Because so. I don't think it fits very well to what they try to do with this movie, yeah, aesthetically, because it, it's an '82 film, but it has the texture, look, and the pacing of a late '70s horror movie. Mm-hmm. In fact, you have a lot of late '70s actors. In yeah, this I movie. think that's Cassavetes feels like he stopped acting in the '70s, and yeah. that's not a slight on him. He just always felt like his his last time period was the '70s. He yeah. made movies in the '80s that looked like they were made in the '70s. It was just that was his look, and it you know works for him very well. But and there one of the reasons why I picked this movie because you have so much new advancements with special effects coming out in '82. Mm-hmm. You have a lot of things going forward. A lot of people talk about the thing, even though that was. A gore fest that people actually oh, yeah. hated, but it pushed the boundaries. It shocked people. Where you have this, it's almost like a re- I would talk about an, an, a retainment. Mm-hmm. Let's oh, this worked in the late seventies. Let's use this aesthetic. And I think if you sold it that way, yeah. that it's a late seventies, not like an early eighties movie that we try to like maybe put the old house on the hill. Yeah, you know, maybe do use a little bit of that aesthetic of just old as late seventies that you probably could retain a little more audience rather than being stuck in just one of those other movies that came out in 82. Yeah, and I think maybe yeah. part of that was Cassavetes himself. Part of it might also be the director. I, I, I've, again, I've only seen Howling 4, but that movie is a movie that did not come out in the 70s, but it feels like it came out in the 70s. It looks like a 70s movie. I don't want to denigrate him too much by saying like that his movies kind of have like a cheaper, older quality to them. Yes. That's kind of how they look, is they kind of have that older and I think if you were presented that way know. rather than just trying to update it yeah it almost feels like you're cheated like oh this is gonna be typical 80s 81 because 81 we came out with a lot of slasher movies yeah just a poured over where this is like oh that's the point but you don't sell it that way you're selling this mysticism this psychic mysticism and so as well that a lot of things happened in the 70s yeah and like I said it goes back to the cheaper aspect of the fact that I think we get maybe 10 to 15 seconds of this creature in yeah. a movie that's named after said creature, like then people feel you know, cheated. They, they feel, feel cheated, and yeah. especially if you're going to compare your film to the thing. And again, I don't think they did this knowing what the finished product of the thing would be. I think they did it based on expectation of what the finished product would be. 
they sold a movie that would be looking like that, but that movie is very creature forward, very visual forward, right. and this one is we're going to give you a bunch of humans running around and then 10 seconds of the creature that we're selling on the poster and in the trailer. Not to mention Probably. you're selling on the last scene in the movie, banking on that shock content, which is not very shocking at all. No. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's it? Because you're really trying to pull off like the Fury, mm -hmm. an end where you, the end, it's all about the end. Yeah. And you're trying to pull off like, oh, that's it. And then you cut and you're like, wow, that was fascinating. It doesn't have that punch. Yeah, see, The Fury is a movie... banking on the punch. The Fury is a fine movie until the end when it becomes, yeah. Yeah. You know, and it, it ends you in a way where, it, throughout some of the faults of The Fury, you get to the end and it doesn't matter as much because it just ends on a pop. It ends on yeah. a you know, literal pop. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, yeah. Whereas John this movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> whereas yeah. this movie, it sells you on kind of a meandering subplot that I wasn't all that invested in and kind of frustrated with. And then you get yeah. to the end, and you're like, is the ending going to save it? Well, it's a question mark. <laughs> All right, good timing to yeah, now talk about it. our review. Yeah. Talk about all the backgrounds. I think we kind of exercise why this movie kind of failed. Mm -hmm. And I think you kind of get bored with it. That's one of the things that you don't want to do with a horror movie is be bored. Yeah. There's and the second act is very many boring. scenes of people talking. Yeah. Uh, and and this, the dialogue does not carry it away. Yeah. yeah, so I can't tell if it's Ray Russell's original book. I have not read it, but I'm actually curious yeah. to read it now because he seems like he had some involvement on the script. I'm curious to see how it compares to this film. But you have, yeah, George Franklin who wrote it. I think the only film I could find was Personals that he wrote. Right. Um, and, and then you have 80% of that dialogue being rewritten by Cassavetes, and I don't even really know where his dialogue is because it doesn't And that's feel okay like for a horror movie. If you're a dialogue-heavy horror movie and your monster's not really shown a lot, guess what? That's what Jaws is. Yeah. <laughs> but, dialogue is heavy with that movie, but you have to be creative and very advancing the story forward with your dialogue if you're not going to show the monster. And the dialogue is super clunky. Yeah. You have John Cassavetti talking to his daughter in the bedroom and like, you're my queen. It's like, is this going to get like... This yeah, I was like, like, maybe this is the part of me that's been watching too much House of the Dragon, but yeah. I was expecting <laughs> right. something like... Anyway, you're in your robe in your daughter's room and you're like, read me the newspaper, you bit wild... Yeah. 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 And then in the autopsy, the greatest, I, I just love the scene, I get a chuckle out of time, when the aesthetic doesn't work and scream, shut her up! Right, it just, <laughs> how many takes of John Cassavetti did you did just to get him to do that? Yeah. I mean, fascinating. So there's a lot of elements that I retain that I find funny that you shouldn't be retainable. You yeah. want the shock value, the gore and all that stuff, but the awkwardness of the mom, the dad in the bedroom is what I remember. John Cassavetti cut to the camera and he's like, obviously looked like they took a ketchup bottle and just, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, and you get that whole thing too, where you know he he goes to confront this reporter and find out like, and kind of like give her the right information in some ways because she's been printing the wrong information. <laughs> and then they go out for a beer, they talk for ten minutes, and all of a sudden they're back at his place. But it doesn't seem like they're back at his place for a, let's go back to my place. He gets yeah. her upstairs and he's like, "I need to tell you about my wife and why you are her." And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah, yeah. You know, there's that. It's it's more of the shock of the what's going on. Awkwardness here. of it. Yeah. It's always shock seen, word. <laughs> it's always seems awkward. Even beginning of the boyfriend girlfriend at the quarry, it seems awkward. Yeah. That you don't. Are they really guys? Boyfriend girlfriend? They almost seem like brother and sister almost. So, <laughs> nothing really gels. And this is why I enjoy the movie. It it's, it nothing really gels. It's super awkward. It's clunky. But also, if you want to know what not to do in a movie, you can't make it boring. You have to have, you, if you're selling a monster, my God, show some, something, so an arm coming out of the water or something killing the guy in the beginning. Yeah, I didn't yeah. even realize that it was the monster's arm at the in the bathroom scene when the, the thing grabs the woman and pulls her. I didn't right. even realize it was the monster's arm because it happened so quickly right. that I just assumed it was long gloves or something where it was like grabbing someone. Yeah. I was like, so oh, this it's is a case the study. monster. <laughs> if I'm, I'm going to write horror movies, I would present this movie like this is what not to do. Yeah. Right. I think there should be a, I, this is going to be mean, but I think there should be a class in colleges if you're going into a filmmaking thing that's called bad cinema, where yeah. they do present movies that do things wrong so that you can learn from them. Because I think in order to be good at what you do, you have to watch the good, but you have to watch the bad too. <laughs> I'm not trying, I'm not, I'm not a horror snob. I really, I'm glad I went back and saw this movie, but I also, like, for filmmaking process, it's like, yeah. if you have an awkward dialogue, and, and this movie's all about dialogue, it's like, God dang, we have to go back to working on something like this. 
Yeah, you have yeah. to find something exposition wise. You, if you're not going to sell the monster, you don't even see it for much for the movie of it. Yeah, but my God, show him a little bit. Show him in the sewer. Show mm-hmm. something. Yeah. yeah, there's there's the conversation. Actually, it's a great time for us to be talking about this film because there's the conversation with the most recent Halloween film. I'm going to give you just a, a mild spoiler alert if you haven't seen the film. Halloween. Is that there's there's Dance. not a lot of Michael Myers in the movie. Which is fine. Which they compared to the original. The original film, I think, nine minutes of Michael Myers. This new right. one has a little, like, close to that low level of Michael Myers. And it's like, at the same time, the presence is felt the entire movie. You know? Right. The shark isn't in Jaws very much, but the presence is felt. This movie, I don't feel... I wasn't even sure there would be a monster. Right. Until, uh, until it showed up in ten seconds of the movie left. And I'm like, you should be selling us on hinting at that monster at yeah. least, so that we know what movie we're watching. Because I was starting to get the idea that maybe it's just a general slasher. Right. Maybe it is, you know? Because I think if I went back and rewrote this script, and it's called Incubus, I would have a... And it's talking about rape and, you know, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. You have to present some kind of sexuality to this thing. And it just yeah. seems like another monster, you just slaps Incubus on it. Yeah, because yeah, I'm not really sure, like... Why they, give us, they give us the legend yeah. of this creature, but I'm not even sure really what it has to do with the rape and murder. I, they yeah. say it does, but I'm like, but does it really have any? Like, does it need to? I mean, you, you know? have a rape scene in the church. Yeah, and that's the monster. When you have to have something like that, because mm-hmm. I think if if you take the church and say it's Incubus, and you're like, well, that makes sense to me. Yeah, and you have a little bit of monster in the church that's very sexualized. Yeah, it's all about naked women, and it's a big giant bat and encompassing a female and all that stuff. Yeah. So if you want to present it that way, I would actually go back to the church and <laughs> rewrite the Incubus and go back to see the movie The Church. I was just going to talk about it because that yeah. movie also doesn't have a lot of monster for the first hour. It has a lot of monster in the last half hour, yeah. but it's it's a movie that you feel the tension for the first hour of the film barely getting the monster at all. Right, and we're going to talk about another movie because you feel safe in a church being an archaeologist but you realize there's some foreboding stuff to this yeah where I've never felt something foreboding I just felt like we're just going to one thing at another yeah but let yeah. me give you at least I'm gonna say this for the film I always I always celebrate a movie for having a swing for the fences idea and I do think this movie is swinging for the fences in terms Especially of, for the ending, of yeah. dealing with kind of like a heavy heavy version of kind of like sexual assault this also I've never seen a film that analyzes sperm in the way this movie analyzes sperm. And I'm, I'm going to give you that credit. You're trying He's something trying new. to say as many times as John is saying in the movie. Yeah, yeah. everyone, take a, take a drink. No, I don't yeah. want you guys to be uh, injured. Um, <laughs> but there, I've never seen a movie that analyzes it in this kind of a way where it's it's at the forefront. Even today, they don't do this in movies very much. But the no, fact they did they it 40 years ago, I'm going to give credit for that. Yeah. It's just a bad movie. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just clunky. It's just a bad movie. It's clunky, and you can solve a lot of problems or just sit and rewrite it because this is what you have. This is what you need to do to keep winning with it. Kyle and I always talk about with screenwriting, where are you winning? Mm-hmm. And if you're winning with the dialogue, okay, we'll then do a lot of it. Yeah. <laughs> Put it in there. Yeah. It's almost like it's almost like they made the movie The Gremlins and they forgot, oh, we need gremlins. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Ten seconds of one gremlin arm. Yeah. You're, you're already in production, you're like, oh yeah, that's right. We have a movie called Gremlins and we need to make gremlins. True fact, that's what it actually happened. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we need gremlins. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this movie almost feels like it's a monster movie. Oh, crap. We need a monster. Yeah. We forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. I think about the uh, the really cheesy, and again, not a good movie either I'm referencing here, but the movie Hobgoblins has terrible creature effects. They're literally creatures that are like this, and like there's a but puppet here just it. doing this. But, but those creatures are in the movie a ton, You see, and it's way more entertaining when you see these little puppet creatures flopping around and someone's raising up an arm and throwing it because it's there it's what you went to the movie to see yeah just like Wizards of Oz you see the flying monkeys how many times maybe five minutes yeah but they're you're in your brain they're there they're always in there <laughs> so have you seen the Incubus yeah not the band the, the movie all right. uh, about not, the band, right? Yeah. yeah this one actually has Bruce Dickinson in it this movie but um, <laughs> yeah, he's, he's the guy he's the guy there oh man uh, anyway I call them Bruce Dickinson. let us know your thoughts on The Incubus where do we watch it do we watch it on Plex Pluto think, oh you watched it Pluto okay I did with Pluto. so we watched it on, on free services and I think that's probably pretty fair that if you haven't seen the barometer of what it is yeah yeah and let us know your thoughts on the film down below uh I kind of want to cover The Legend of Hell House eventually, but if you want to see it, you got to let us know down in the comments section. If you want us to cover another John Huff movie, we'd love to do so. But it's got to be on you to tell us to do so down in the comments. And while you're down there, please like and subscribe. 
They don't cost you anything, but mm-hmm. they help to support the channel at the same time, and you never miss new episodes of the show because we got three times a week new episodes. We also have a bunch of episodes on that Patreon, like Nick mentioned. Go check it out. The links are down in the description. And you guys can check out all my film reviews over at filmreviews.com. And you can find my show, the St. Paul Filmcast, anywhere if I'm finding podcasts, and Kyle and I are going to go dipping in the quarry.